Ali, do we have you with us? Sorry, I was on mute, sorry, yes. Fine, thank you, Ali. Um, just before we start, just two quick announcements. We're going to record the session, so I hope you all wouldn't mind that. And the other thing is that we might take uh, screenshots um, throughout the session, so I also hope you wouldn't mind that. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to see you all. Um, it's also a pleasure to welcome our um, speaker for today, um, Ali. Ali is, um, I'm just going to find your bio data, Ali, here, here. So Ali Qasim is an Arab Council for Social Sciences postdoctoral research fellow at the Beirut Urban Lab at the American University of Beirut, funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Ali is also a tutor at the School of Law, Politics, Sociology at the University of Sussex, where he obtained his PhD last year, and a steering committee member at the Sussex Centre for Colonial and Postcolonial Studies. Ali has previously held research and teaching positions at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Michigan, the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, the Lebanese Centre for Policy Studies, the Lebanese American University, the American University of Beirut, and others. His main interests are post-anti- and decolonial work, ethnic racial studies, inequality, Islam, knowledge, and uh, making, uh, Islam and knowledge making, on which ha Ali has published multiple peer-reviewed and non-academic essays and articles. His current research focuses on the lived experiences of discrimination and inclusion of visibly Muslims in Lebanon, with a particular focus on the role of urbanity as an institution of modernity and coloniality. So thank you very much, Ali, for accepting our invitation. We look forward to our session today. This session is going to be a little bit unusual. So um, we're going to have two parts. The first is going to be um, Ali's account um, of his understanding of coloniality and modernity and the westernized university as a manifestation of these. This will be followed by a discussion of that kind of theoretical part. We will then um, focus in our second part about what this all means uh, for um, research as an anti-colonial tool. And um, again, followed by a discussion. So the general theory first, then discussion, then more focus on the research specifically and a discussion. Um, I hope that's fine with you all. Ali, is that correct? Is that the procedure? Yep. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that, Mariam. Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you everyone for, your, for coming. Um, I, 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 hope, I hope it turns out enjoyable and, and, and useful. Um, so as Mariam said, let, let me start screen sharing and um, just to say that I don't, so when I, if you feel that you want to stop me at any point throughout, that's, that's, I'm also cool with that. Just if there's anything you feel you, you, you want me to elaborate on more. Um, but the, the format that we've envisioned for the session is that we'd start with um, a bit of a theoretical overview, which is, uh, on modernity, coloniality, and then very briefly on the westernized university. And then we can have a discussion about that. And then from there, we can move on to the question of research and decolonization. And I won't be so, and I'm also hoping that we can have a discussion around um, while we do the, the, the part on research and decolonization, because what I will try to do is thought provoke in, in terms of some of the key axes um, or vectors or horizons that a decolonial approach would take to research and decolonization and how these would work together. Um, but I am very interested in hearing what you think and, and, and how we can develop this, because of course, this is all quite emerging scholarship, let's say. Um, okay, so this, should, should I start or does anyone want to kind of say anything first or? Um... Yeah, you can start, Ali. All good. Okay, so modernity, coloniality, I think many of you would, will be familiar with this, but just kind of as a recap um, and, and, and to, to bring the pieces together. 
So usually within, within across our disciplines, right? So across disciplines, including education, sociology, uh, political science, and, and across the social sciences and the humanities, but also more broadly within more public understandings of modernity. Modernity is understood as something that has emerged in Europe. Right. So in, in, in theory, we see this with everyone, including people like Kohn, Durkheim, Weber, Marx, Gellner, Parsons, and so on, who tried to theorize what modernity was, how it emerged, and why it happened in Europe. Um, throughout, there are, there are a number of assumptions about what happened and how the world became modern, and specifically how Europe became modern, and then how the, world, how the rest of the world became modern. And these center around the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, and the Renaissance as the four axes of modernity's emergence, right? So the Industrial Revolution as the emergence of capital, as the emergence of, of, um, of production, as the emergence of everything that came later in terms of consumption, in terms of lifestyle. The French Revolution as the emergence of a modern political order. Um, the Scientific Revolution as the emergence of the modern model of, of science production and dissemination. Um, and then the Renaissance as the emergence of, as, as, as a wheel of, of culture and modern culture beginning to turn. And throughout the key assumption is that these are all questions of progress, of, the, of civility and of development. So the idea is that all of these were, were steps forward in the history of mankind. Um, and that these were good things that happened in Europe for for specific reasons that made Europe special and that allowed this to happen there. Over the past, what is it now, 30 years or so, 25 to 30 years, a group of scholars known as the Decolonial Studies Collective um, have been trying to argue against the, the narratives that underlie these assumptions, but also against the specific uh, stories and the specific um, discourses that they, they, they offer and that they produce and reproduce. These are um, people, in, so, so the, the Decoloniality Studies Collective or the Modernity Decoloniality Studies Collective is inspired by, mainly by two philosophers, and these are Anibal Quijano and Enrique Dicel. And then we have a whole bunch of people who've been working on different aspects and different themes of this. And so these include people like Walter Mignolo, Ramon Grosfuquel, Rolando Vasquez, Madina Tostanova, Catherine Walsh, and so on. And what they've been trying to do, and I'm not going to do that now for the lack of time and because we, we want to get to something else, but they've been taking specific cases. So for example, um, and this is something that Gurminder, who's, who's at Sussex, has, has extensively worked on um, and, and is one of the leading figures on. So for example, if we take the case of the Industrial Revolution and we look at how the Industrial Revolution happened, um, a, a proper historicization of the Industrial Revolution shows us that it's not something that was endogenous to Europe. It was something that was only possible as a result of colonization, right? From, from the fact that cotton does not grow in Europe, that it was grown in slave, plant, in, in slave plantations, to the fact that the technology used to dye the cotton was brought from what is today known as Pakistan and India, to the fact that um, the selling of British cotton, of English cotton, that started the whole process that we would call industrial revolution was only made possible by the British empire destroying villages and, and, um, and weavers that existed in, in many different places in Asia. So what they've been trying to do is to rehistoricize the emergence of modernity. And from their position, so what they've done, what I, what I would say they've done very, very powerfully is to debunk the myth of the French Revolution, of the Industrial Revolution, of the Scientific Revolution, and of the Renaissance, ask questions of progress, civility, and development, and specifically to debunk these and to rewrite what happened and to bring the colonial to the center of it. And instead of this story of modernity, um, they offer an alternative story of what happened and how we got to where we got. And, and from a decolonial position, it's very important to understand the history that structures the present if we are to understand the present and, and be able to engage with it. So from a decolonial position, the present started, modernity started in 1492. 1492 was, um, was the moment when Europeans landed on what is now known as uh, the Americas, specifically in, in a region that First Nations call Abiyayala, um, and that and started a process of colonization and of enrichment. And, and again, so I'm, I'm going to need to skip over this for, for, for the lack of time. But they also offer a, a very lengthy analysis of what specifically happened that allowed 
um, what were the differences between Europe and indigenous American communities, be this in terms of Europe having developed war machinery and coming out of the Crusades, coming out of a very specific history where war was really central to the different European kingdoms, uh, while this was not the case in, um, in, for indigenous communities. So there was a huge imbalance in, in how well they knew how to kill. Um, two questions of health and epidemiologies and viruses that existed in Europe that massacred the indigenous communities when they were introduced there. Two questions of those indigenous communities being elder centered and, and so a whole analysis of what happened to specifically allow Europe to colonize the Americas, which, which really de-exceptionalizes it. So which really allows us to understand, okay, this is what happened. It wasn't because Europe was, was more developed or more civilized or, or, um, or advanced or anything. It was for a very bunch of specific reasons that are really reasons of death and that are really reasons of aggression and that are really reasons um, that, that, that would be very, very problematic for us, for, for many of us, I, I, would, I would think. But the idea is that with the colonization of the Americas, incredible wealth started, started flowing into Europe, right? So the, the Americas were very rich in many of the things and in, in most of the things that were really important at the time, be this coffee, be this gold, which, which coffee, which later became really important, be this gold, be this silk, um, be this, um, a lot of, natural or might call natural products that were extracted and that existed in abundance within the Americas that were later taken to Europe. Before 1492, we had a pluriversal world. So there was a world where there were multiple civilizations that existed, um, that competed in many ways, but that coexisted and that engaged with, with one another and that enriched one another in, in, in different ways. After 1492 or starting in 1492, that started uh, dying out and the emergence of a universal world where Europe leads or where Europe controls and dominates bega began emerging. And here in, in the 16th century, um, four major genocides and epistemicides took place that were central and foundational for the emergence of the modern world. The first one is the genocide and, and why genocide epistemicide. So epistemicide is this word that, or play on words that argues that what was happening was not just the killing of people, it was the killing of knowledges. It was the killing of, of ways of being in the world, of epistemes, of ways of inhabiting the world um, and engaging with it. So the first one was um, that genocide, epistemicide of indigenous communities in the Americas, which was very systematic. The second one was the genocide, epistemicide um, of African enslaved people through the slave trade. The third one was the epistemicide um, genocide of Muslim and Jewish people who were thrown out of um, what, is now, what is now Spain, of Al-Andalus and, and, and surrounding regions. And the fourth one was Europe's internal colonization of itself um, through a number of processes, the most famous of which is the witch hunt. So the, the, the annihilation and, and the erasure of different knowledges that existed within Europe that, are, that were not in line with um, the power structure in place. And the purpose of this was to, to homogenize Europe on internally, and then to begin controlling and homogenizing the rest of the world in the image of, in, in an image that serves the European power elite. Now, um, I don't know if I'm going too fast, but it, it's just because it's, this is a bit of a background and I think people are already familiar with some of it or maybe all of it. So, so that's why, but if you feel I'm going too fast, please stop me. What I want from this is, modernity coloniality as a concept so modernity slash or dash coloniality is is something that the decolonial studies collective have proposed to say that there is no modernity without coloniality and coloniality is not colonialism so coloniality is this, the power structure that emerged or be, that began to emerge with the colonization of the americas but that led became a power structure that is independent from the actual act of colonizing a particular space in the sense of a, a, a particular power taking over another taking them home. Um, so what, what this does is it shifts the narrative of how modernity emerged, but also, sorry. Um, so what this does is that it shifts the narrative of how modernity emerged, but it also shifts the narrative of how the present came to be, right? So the present as a modern colonialist, um, not just in the sense of 
of, of physical or political colonization, but at the level of epistemology, at the level of knowledge, at the levels of cultures, at the levels of economy, at, or refers to the, the refers to this as the darker side of Western modernity that is consistently concealed. And that puts up a research agenda Ali, sorry of to everything that exists. Ali, sorry to interrupt. Your, your um, voice is, is breaking a little bit. So if you could just... Um, oh, is it? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, if you could just repeat the um, last sort of two, three minutes, that would be great. And, okay, um, yeah, I will, I will, but let me, I have a couple of windows open, let me close them down, that might be kind of... Uh, yeah, I will also switch off my camera, maybe that will help. Okay, so... Um, Sorry, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, no, that's great, thank you, Mariam, for that. Um, I'm not sure where, where, where it broke off, but what the... The takeaway from this is that we cannot think of modernity without thinking of coloniality, that modernity and coloniality are co-constitutive, and that they're co-constitutive in, in the sense that coloniality is modernity's darker side. So coloniality does not exist without um, coloniality does not exist without modernity, modernity does not exist without coloniality. And this pushes us to think about coloniality within the different spaces and the different fields and the different um, institutions that exist in the modern world, including the modern university, which I'll come to in a minute. So the, the argument that the decolonial studies collective have been making is how can we historicize the present? How can we understand how it emerged and consequently de-exceptionalize it, uh, de-fetishize it and so on? But more importantly, how can we understand the production of modernity and its reproduction in the current moment? So coloniality is not a structure of power that existed. It's a it, it, it is the current structure of power that is across the world that became very much. So if we take the example of Egypt um, as one of many, coloniality in Egypt took place before colonialism, right? So coloniality started off with the colonization of the Americas, but it then became its own thing and became very, very, very powerful. And in a lot of places in the world, it, it preceded colonialism and it allowed colonialism and it paved the ground for actual colonialism. And then when, when decolonization happened in, um, in after post-World War II, and after World War II, coloniality survived in, in very, very powerful ways. So the point is that we live under coloniality. And that, that is really important to think of modern universities. Before I go to modern universities, does anyone want to stop me about anything um, at this point? All good? Yes, I think we can proceed, Ali. Very interesting, thank you. Great. So, when we think of the modern university, um, again, the invitation or decolonial invitation would one be to historicize it, two, to think of the conditions and the features of its emergence, and two, and three, to think of its objectives. So what does it want to do? Where does it come from? And what allows it to be? Now, this is a, this is a whole project that's, that's, that's emerging and that, that a number of people are working on. Um, but the takeaway from this is that the modern university has is, or for, for, from a decolonial perspective, the word is a westernized university. Um, and that this, this modern westernized university that exists across the globe was and continues to be an integral element of the structures of power in place, i.e. of modernity, of modernity coloniality, right? So it emerged, it took the form it takes with modernity coloniality at the service of modernity coloniality um, and from within modernity coloniality, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But what, what the decolonial invitation really wants to push is to think of the westernized university by thinking through the epistemological questions. 
right? So to think of the westernized university, not just as an apparatus um, in the way a lot of kind of critical work has been doing, but to take the question to the epistemological in the sense of, in, in a number of different senses, but, but to kind of give, a, a, give an idea of, of, of this. The westernized university has a very specific kind of knowing subject. And this is not something that is peculiar to the westernized university. This is the subject of modernity. And there's a whole theorization in decolonial thought on the emergence of the Cartesian eye, that, that, that subject that knows the world and that knows the world in a very specific way. And that, that modern subject is a subject that is detached from the world, from earth and from life within, um, within a very dualistic cosmology, what, what Gross Kukel calls the dualistic cosmology of the world. Um, that subject is an ego. So that subject is a very arrogant subject that takes the position of, of knowing and the ability of knowing other things without having to be known, without having to be revealed, without having to engage with those things, um, but through their, their transformation into objects of knowledge. That subject is non-contextual, um, what Mignolo calls the God I view. So that subject claims knowledge that is absolute, that is universal, and that is independent from the context in which he, in, in which he, he because mainly it's a he, exists. And that subject himself is in turn universalized. So that subject is transformed into the, into the complete, full, um, most developed human. And in this sense, it, it is that specific kind of knowing subject, which is not a subject that emerged in the university, which is, more, which is actually a subject that emerged, um, that emerged in modernity, coloniality, and that the university later became an institution of that the university relies on and that it also reproduces. And key questions to think about when thinking about this knowing subject and the kind of knowledge um, that, that he can produce is to think of the Cartesian eye, but also is to think of Latin Christendom. And Latin Christendom and, and decolonial thought, the way I read decolonial thought, is quite separate from Christianity. Um, it, it is a very specific articulation of Christianity and a very specific institutionalized power-laden articulation of Christianity. It needs to be thought of and, and understood in relation to binarisms and categorical logic that is dominant within Euro modernity. And also, and very importantly for decolonial theory, it needs to be understood in relation to anthropocentrism. Um, I'm not, I, I, I don't know if, if people are familiar with anthropocentrism as, as kind of a conceptual category. Maybe you can explain that for us, Ali, please, briefly. Uh, sure. So, so anthrop anthropocentrism. So, there's this whole discussion, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, about uh, the Anthropocene and and the kind of times we live in, and humans' impact on the on on the Earth and and the destruction of of the planet and the ecological catastrophe and so on. Um, but the anthropocentrism is is a specific argument within decolonial thought that that takes the Anthropocene and that resituates it within modernity coloniality as a wider structure of power. And that argues that within modernity coloniality, the logic of modernity coloniality is centered around an anthropocentric understanding of the world. So i.e. an understanding of the world that situates the human, and here the human is, de is, is defined in a very, very specific way, the same way that Cartesian defined his, his thinking I, um, that situates the human at the center of the world and that approaches the rest of the world as objects of consumption and, 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 and objects of, um, of destruction in many different ways. And this has to do with the whole kind of, and, and then there's a whole discussion about how anthropocentrism began and when it started. Um, and the decolonial argument is that it started in 1492 with the mass death that was brought upon by the four genocides, epistemicides of the long 16th century. Now, the, the flip side of this is that by being this specific kind of knowing subject, by structuring its knowledges in these specific ways and under these categories. This epistemological question is produces or creates a locus of enunciation that erases and silences in the sense of it, it makes the westernized university a particular institution that not, not only produces knowledge, but that erases other knowledges and that silences other knowledges and that makes them impossible, right? That makes them invisible, that makes them unenunciable. And they can no longer be said. They can no, they no longer have the legitimacy of being said. 
they no longer have the, leg the legitimacy of existing. And this is something that was happening starting in 1492. And, and the clearest examples are the burning of libraries um, within indigenous communities in the Americas, in, in Al-Andalus, in a number of different places, and the destruction of those knowledges, but also the destruction of the forms of social organization that, that had that knowledge transmission. So the destruction of um, social forms of organization in Al-Andalus that had specific ways of transmitting knowledge, the, the destruction of, of, um, of elders within indigenous communities and their role in transmitting knowledge. And, and we can have a, a, whole, a whole discussion and, and examples around that. But, but the argument is that the westernized university works to produce a specific kind of episteme or produces a specific kind of episteme and offers a specific kind of episteme while simultaneously having a darker side which is the erasure of all other forms or all other epistemes, all other forms of knowledge, all other forms of knowing subject, all other relations to the earth and, and life, all other contextualizations, all other um, forms of logic, all other forms of relating to, to everything that exists. Does that make a bit of sense? Am I making a bit of sense? Yes, thank you, Ali. Yes, it does. Okay. So, um, just to, in, in this kind of understanding, one, there's, uh, Grosfukel has made the argument that in order to understand the university, we need to play on the word because it's really in the word. The university is something that wants to establish a universality that is not universal. Which, and there's, there's, of course, a huge difference here, right? So it's something that is very, very, very specific, right? It has a specific kind of knowing subject, a specific kind of logic, a specific kind of history, a specific kind of emergence and a very specific objective that it's pursuing. But it, it wants to, to universalize that. It wants to turn it into the universe, right? It wants to turn the universe into this one homo homogenous thing. And understood as, the, as such, the curriculum that a university adopts can be defined as an official selection that structure knowledge in, knowledge in ways, privileging a particular construction of knowledge, of geography, of color, of spiritual religious understanding, and that actively erases otherness. So curriculum is, not, is, is, is something that, that produces and reproduces a particular way of knowing, and by doing so, erases all other ways of knowing. So if, if we understand the modern university within this framework, um, we understand it as something that has emerged from within structures of power and within structures of knowledge and within structures of being. So very specific ways of, of knowing the world, very specific ways of being in the world and as an institution that is inherently committed to these. And we can, see this across, we can see this in the materiality of modern universities. We can see it in its iconography, in its identification, in its ethos, in its telos, and, and how it functions um, ac across its sectors. Acro in, so we can see it from the way, from its architecture to the way it organizes its disciplines. And, and, and what is relevant for us here is, is we can see it in the way it does research and the way it has done research and the way it has attempted to produce knowledge. So the last thing, yeah, the last thing I'd say in, in, in this respect is that the university and academia more broadly from a decolonial perspective are tools of coloniality, they're institutions of coloniality. They're not things that exist within it. They are things that were central to its emergence and, and things that are and continue to be central for its reproduction. And they, and they do this in very, very different ways, but most importantly, and hopefully I'll come back to the slide at the end. They do this by defining and, and having the, the exclusive right to define who is it, what is legitimate knowledge in, in the world by, by de determining what is legitimate knowledge in the modern university. Everything else becomes superstition. Everything else becomes folk tales. Everything else uh, becomes backwardness. Everything else becomes lesser knowledge that does not have the right of being accepted into the space of, of, of modern knowledge, of developed knowledge. And entwined with this is the exclusive right to determine what, who, who legitimate knowledge producers are in the world by determining who legitimate knowledge producers are in the modern university. So scholars, scientists acknowledged with degrees are legitimate knowledge producers. Community elders in, in indigenous communities are not. And consequently, um, it has the exclusive right and it, it performs the exclusive right, which, which services modernity in many different ways, 
of legitimate knowledge dissemination in the modern world by the exclusive rights of legitimate knowledge disseminators and determining who these are and, and how they work within the modern university. And a lot of times, not a lot of times, usually this is presented as natural, um, as normal, as, no, as necessary, as inevitable, and so on. But what the decolonial invitation is saying is that this is not, right? It's that this is a very specific form of knowledge and a very specific kind of knowledge and a very specific kind of knowing subject and a very specific kind of knowledge dissemination that is not the story of humanity. It's not the story of everyone. It's not the story of the globe. It's a very specific story that has been turned into the story of the globe through processes of extraction and violence and, 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 and control and domination and so on. Okay, um, I, I, I will stop here. I think I'm, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm on time anyway. So I will stop here. Maybe we can have a discussion around this and then we can um, do the last, the second part on, um, on research and, and forms of ways of how, how research is, is envisioned or, or how it can be theorized as a way of resistance. Thank you very much, Ali, for that very inspiring and thought-provoking. Um, we will have a short period for discussion here, um, particularly opportunities for asking. Ali, any questions? Yeah, Mario? Um, thanks, Ali. I, I think that was a really nice um, uh, walkthrough of, of uh, decoloniality. De um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was the absence of any reference to uh, capitalism and imperialism in the talk. And I kind of feel that there is a missing part of the story that you told, which is about third world Marxism, um, dependency theory, uh, Franz Fanon, and the struggles around a rewriting of Marxist theory, which put the South in the center, um, a kind of flipped Marxism. Because I, I, when I listen to people like, for example, Boaventura de Souza Santos, who is one of these very key things, you can, he still calls himself a Marxist and he still sees Marxism, whereas others kind of walk away from Marxism and in a sense say, you know, it's a bit like the kind of post-structural move that once you move to decoloniality, you, you, you reject Marxism. And my sense is that these two bodies of thought are also divided in terms of their engagement with political struggle and transformation. So for example, Boaventura is actively involved in social movements, actively involved in political organizations, whereas Mignolo always strikes me as being quite floaty and not really engaged with organization and political movements. So I wondered if you could reflect a little bit on that, uh, you know, those legacies. Uh, Miriam, should I take each, each question? Yes, yes, just okay. take each question as it comes. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mario, for that. That's, that's a really excellent question, of course. Um, so there's this whole discussion. Now, just to say, um, coloniality, there's, I mean, of course, just because for the purposes of this workshop, I, I didn't go into any of that, but coloniality is developed as what, what, what is termed to the colonial matrix of power, um, which is then developed into specific constitutive elements. So what makes up coloniality, you know? And, and capital and capitalism is an essential component in, in that respect or, or essential pillar of, of, of coloniality and, and how it's theorized, including by Mignolo. But I definitely agree that Mignolo so in, in developing the colonial matrix of power, Mignolo set, very, very clearly asserts that capital, capital accumulation, capitalism are, um, are pillars of that and that they've always been pillars of that. But for example, in, in the darker side of the Western modernity, the book, uh, capitalism hardly comes up again. So Mignolo definitely, I mean, so there is that acknowledgement within, within the decolonial studies collective but I agree that it's not taken seriously and that its theoretical implications are not really pushed forward. Um, and I think this is, so for example, Gurminder's work here is really, really important, especially her kind of what, her current work on re-theorizing capitalism um, and, and the article that recently came out um, in terms 
re-theorizing political economy and, and what it means, what does it mean to, to decolonially think of political economy and the emergence of capital and capitalism. Um, but, but I think so that there is this question of the epistemological and the material that this really touches on eventually. Um, and, I, and I don't think it's a, it needs to be a, a competition between the epistemological and the material because they, I can't think of them separately. As a, and, and I think this is what it means to think of coloniality as a structure of power that has multiple components and that has multiple forms of being and multiple institutions that allow its production and reproduction. And definitely capital is really, really central in this respect. And, and, and specifically in our case, neoliberalism is really central in this respect. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. So I agree with what you're saying. Um, I, I Maybe I should have kind of brought it up somewhere, but, but for the, I thought for the purposes of speaking of, about the university and yeah, no, now what I'm saying, I'm, I was, I was going to say that for the purposes of speaking about the university, an epistemological focus would make sense. But of course, it also does not make sense to speak of the university without, without speaking of capital accumulation and uh, that, that allowed it to exist in the first place. You know, capital extraction from the colonies that allowed those universities to come into being and that were later in really, really important for, for what they did and, and their whole movement. And also today about the neoliberalization of the university and how that's functioning to produce and reproduce coloniality. And, and, in specific ways. So, so yeah, I think that's a very good point. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Ali. Um, we have any further questions, thoughts, reflections? You're also welcome to put them in the chat or just uh, raise your hand. No. So it either made perfect sense or it made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> right. But I had a question for you, Ali, if nobody has a question. And it is about the propagation of a specific type of knowing subject. Um, it's about that point. And from what I understood, um, what we are doing in higher education now is that we are actually reproducing that very same knowing subject um, that you have referred to. My question is, how can we um, break that cycle? Um, how can we become more aware of what we are doing and change it? What, it, what are some of the steps to change that? Uh, th does anyone else have a question? <laughs> <laughs> That's a really difficult question, Maria. I, I mean, this is, this is about the possibility or the impossibility of decolonizing the university as, as a structure eventually. Um, so let, let, let me just, okay, so one example that, that's come up in decolonial thought is the kinds of knowledges that have been termed, that have been termed as folk tales or that have been termed as superstition that exist within a number of different civilizations. And those knowledges, the, for, for those communities, they are gained through, through a whole variety of different ways, including, for example, communicating with nature. Right? So if I have um, a community elder somewhere that says, I can communicate with the wind within a, a modern kind of what's what's the you know, if, if within a modern science, this is nonsense. So can can we break out of these within the scope of the university? So in, in terms of teaching in terms of um, in terms of an institution, I, I honestly don't know. And that's why there's a there's a significant argument within decolonial thought that the university itself in its totality as an institution cannot be decolonized. Um, and, and I mean, it needs to be well, and in and, and the terms of some 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 scholars who've, who've worked on this, it needs to be burnt down. Um, so I think because the, so specifically in terms of the knowing subject, because that's really at the core of its entire movement. You know, it's implicit within everything it does. It's implicit with its structures, the entirety of its, of its role and of, and of, and, and, and of, its, um, of its knowledges and of its ways of doing things. So if we're gonna get away from that, I think we'll have a very, very, very different form of, well, it's not even an institution anymore. Um, so I'm not sure we can do that locally you know so i so what, what, I, what i'm saying is moving away from 
from the university and modernity is not in subject, it requires a solution that is, or requires a move that is on, on a big scale, not, not, not on a local one, not on a very kind of um, positioned one, if that makes a bit of sense. And, but maybe, but maybe at the end, uh, some of the things that we might talk about research um, might, might also help in, in, in getting to this question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. And I think being aware of it in the first place is the key to all that, being aware of the context and being aware of who we are and where we are um, in our own respective settings is the first step. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a question from Birgül. No. <clears throat> oh, thanks, Ali, for this excellent presentation. Um, I think um, what I am interested in, um, like yourself, I, I, I think is incredible contribution um, and problematization of this universal um, logic of westernization and, and colon, uh, col coloniality. But what, when I read um, the colonial um, um, scholars, and the work of them, there is this, um, I feel like there is inevitable um, homogenizations of the spaces of coloniality as if these colonial spaces is somehow, um, or the, the logic of coloniality is imposed on these spaces without any resistance. Uh, a and kind of eliminates the resistance is the existed against the logic of coloniality, and B somehow underplays the sudden demand or the uh, indigenous demand that happened in the spaces of this colonial uh, coloniality. So I find it a little bit difficult because the universalism of the modernity of the logic of colonialism, the coloniality has not traveled by itself. Often there is some kind of internal demand that increased and exacerbated these effects. Um, so how do we understand this? And it's, it's the same thing in the university, right? I mean, this, the, the particular and specific knowledge and the subject formation um, although it's been strengthened by the institutions, by the procedures, by the processes, by the politics, nonetheless, there is an internalization of this that manifests through our bodies, right? Willingly or unwillingly. So it is not imposed us. So I kind of link to Miriam's um, question in the sense, how do we de-link? But de-linking, um, should be put in a kind of prospect, knowing that there is this dynamics, right? That I underline both. We are not just, um, <clears throat> you know, some people do want to this logic, even though they are colonial subject or, or created. And also, even though we want to resist, we sometimes, you know, we want to be part of these processes. And I think that um, I'm just trying to also find a way to use the coloniality in my work, but I have I am having some problems in understanding and grasping fully how I can address some of these issues. Thank you. Baby. Thank you. Um, thanks for that. that. That's a really excellent, excellent, excellent point. And I think it's it's also similar to to the to the point raised by Mario earlier about capitalism. So in 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 the decolonial scholarship, we always find an acknowledgement or an assertion um, that people are agents, that there is the possibility, not there is that, there, there, that resistance is always happening, that coloniality is always being resisted, that it's not a totality. Um, Mignolo is very adamant about kind of making it clear, so is Gros Fouquet and others, about making it clear that modernity is, has always been resisted um, and his whole theorization about the borders of modernity and what exists on the borders of modernity and, as, and, and then transforming the borders as sites of alternatives and of identifying alternatives. The borders, of course, not, not in terms of geographic borders, but in terms of epistemological and civilizational borders of modernity. Um, 
But then again, in, in a lot of the scholarship, it also ends up not being taken seriously or it ends up being left behind. Um, and I and I personally, in my own work, I also struggle with this because I am trying to, I am very interested in the question of resistance, be this impossibility or possibility of resistance, you know? And I think one thing here is, so there is this, 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 this disillusionment within the colonial thought with resistance because um, in a lot of places, resistance, and this includes the anti, a lot, of, a huge part of the anti-colonial movements that took place in, in, in the post-World War II moment, were not about resisting modernity, coloniality, but about resisting the exclusion from it, right? About becoming a part of it, about, about being included or accepted as a part of the project of modernity. And the decolonial approaches, and, and that's the whole kind of, one of their problems with a lot of the post-colonial literature is that they're saying, well, we don't want to be included in modernity. We've, we understand modernity in a specific way and it's a horrible project. Why in the world would you want to be a part of it? And the fact that a lot of the resistance that has taken place and Maryam including a lot of the resistance in, in, in knowledge and in terms of universities and teaching and a lot of the things that we saw in the global South um, has not resisted modernity coloniality in the sense of delinking from it, but has resisted modernity coloniality in the sense of saying, well, we're, mo we're modern too, and, and we can have these same structures and these same institutions. We can have great universities, write great papers, do excellent research. We can have a lot of technology, um, you know, have um, excellent planes, high-tech airports, what, what have you. So I think that's a part of why um, a lot of this, this looking at resistance has become for a lot of decolonial scholars, this thing that's quite, oh no, not that again. Um, but, but definitely it's, it's super important to think of this. And I think the, the, the concept and the work around the borders of modernity and, or the margins of modernity and, and what happens there and, and how the dwelling within them resists coloniality, but, but in, in those very, very complex um, ways is, is really important. But yeah, I, I totally agree with, 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 with what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Birgil. And um, we have a quick comment here from Fauzia. Um, I think your point around understandings of nature and our relationship with nature are so important to raise here, particularly when thinking about the relationship between modernity, industrialization, capitalism, and the environmental consequences of this. Uh, thanks for raising this. Also, never thought before about how there is a supposed universe in university or the etymology of this. Um, yeah, okay. yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think the question of nature is really, really, really important for, for all of these. And, and also in terms of the climate catastrophe that, that we're facing, but also more broadly in terms of how we engage with the world and how we inhabit it. Um, and the university, just to say, so this is a lot like Catholic, you know, Catholic means universal or, or, or overall or general, or, you know, it's, it's the, so it's, it's a lot of these terms come in there. Um, and of course, so university in the way that it was approached, it didn't, they didn't want it to mean universe. They wanted it to mean the space of knowledge and, and what have you, but it's, it's, it's ironic that, that the word or that it, it plays on, on those, um, et, those etymologies really allow us to see what is it doing? What is it reproducing uh, in, in very complex ways and very subtle ways. Thank you very much. I, I want to reiterate the importance of the environment as well. And this idea about us seeing the environment as the other, something that it's, is a, we extract from, we make use of, and that's why we don't need to deplete, other, rather than having the same right to exist as ourselves uh, in that sense, which is a totally different worldview. Okay, so oh. I think, yeah. Yeah, well, could we move on to the, uh, to the yeah, next part of that? I think we are ready now to move to the second part of um, this session. So, um, Ali, the floor is yours again. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Maryam. Yeah. Okay. So, what I want to do here, and, and briefly, and I won't take up a lot of time, um, and maybe we can have a bit more space for, for a conversation again, is to think through research and, and, and how research can be envisioned from within a decolonial, one, one of the many ways, of course, there are many ways that research can be envisioned from within a decolonial uh, perspective or position, but one of the ways um, that this can happen is to think of research as a form of resistance, research as a form of, of resisting against modernity coloniality. And I think to do that and to think of research in that sense, a first step would need to be to identify modernity's others and then to be oriented by them. 
And in, so in terms of setting research agendas, in terms of identifying the things that we explore, the knowledges that we pursue, um, the kinds of work that we do, I think starting by identifying who has been othered by modernity and consequently who has been erased, who has been invisibilized, who has been subalternized and so on. And then being oriented by those others, by their agendas, by their concerns, by their struggles, by their problems, by their issues, by their lives and so on, um, is, is a starting point for a decolonial research agenda. And, and it's really important within this paradigm to accept that the oppressed can speak for the conditions of their oppression. Because if we want to resist modernity coloniality, we want to one, understand it, and two, understand alternatives to it. And if we think that people who are subalternized by modernity coloniality do not understand modernity coloniality and its functioning, it would be really, really difficult for us to envision them as, um, to envision their experiences as the sites from where modernity coloniality can be understood and resisted and to envision them as subjects or, or people or humans um, alongside whom we can think of and theorize modernity coloniality and also then think of and theorize alternatives to it and ways of resisting it. So what I'm saying here is that from a decolonial perspective, a research agenda needs to pursue alternatives and it needs to do this alongside modernity's others and their epistemes and their modes of being in the world. And I think that and, and a key objection that kind of comes to this at times is that, well, of course, you're, you're not seriously saying that we need to limit the kind of research we do to research with modernity's others. Well, I am sort of, because we have a lot of knowledge that has been invisibilized, that has been erased over the past 500 years. And if research is a knowledge pursuing process, if it's something that wants to know, if it's something that wants to bring out knowledge, and of course here there's in, in decolonial thought, there's the word, and not just in decolonial thought and, 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 um, and a lot of critical thinking, it's, it's, yeah, so there's this whole knowledge making, not knowledge production. So if it's a process of, if research is a process of knowledge making, then that knowledge making needs to, and, and to thinking of the priorities and the challenges of our modern world and of our contemporary world, that knowledge making needs to, to orient itself to thinking alongside um, modernity's others. Why this is so, and, this, this, and I think this is really, really important for a decolonial um, approach. So a decolonial approach really starts from the position that the world is not okay, that things are not working, that we're not at a good place, and that um, it's, it's really kind of all, it's, it's, it's all horrible. Now, some people might come to that conclusion and say, yes, it's not okay, it's horrible. Let, we need to figure out alternatives. We need to bring out alternatives. We need to find alternatives. That's not the decolonial approach. The decolonial approach says things have broken down. Well, not, not as I understand that, at least, of course. Things have broken down. We're in a very, very bad situation. We don't need to invent alternatives. Alternatives exist and they have long existed. And they allowed human beings to live in, in very generative ways in relation with nature and in relation with others for, for very long times, up until what started in 1492 erased all of those differences and all of those alternatives and transformed the world into what we have it today. So what we need to move forward, forward in the sense of moving away from the current conditions and the current crises that we face, is not to come up with a new thing that no one has ever found before. But it is to re-legitimize and listen to the modes of being in the world and the epistemologies that have long existed and that continue to exist. Of course, this doesn't fetishize them. It doesn't transform any of those epistemologies into a totality. It, it's definitely not arguing that, they, that any one of them has the fit all solution or that it has the complete solution to all of our crises. Definitely not. And of course, all of these civilization models had problems, had problematic things about them, had limitations, there were issues there for sure. Um, and, and of course, there's a whole theorization here about how that erasure took place and how modernity ended up taking a lot of these things and, and, and using them in specific ways. But the argument is that they also had, especially at the terms of their epistemes, very, very generative um, approaches to the world and very, very generative approaches to being in the world that would allow us to move away from the crises that we face today. 
one of the key examples here is the environmental crises, ecological questions, and, and ways that people have lived with the earth and alongside the earth and uh, in relation to the earth for a very long time without having any kind of um, catastrophic impact on it or, or any kind of negative impact even. Um, but of course, there are other examples. So it's not just about the ecological question. What I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that um, what, what a decolonial invitation might lead us to is, is the process of learning to listen to modernity's others and to transform listening other into a methodology, right? So whereby listening to modernity's others becomes a methodology of envisioning futures that can move us away from the crises that modernity has brought upon us. And in this sense, listening would need to be understood as a listening to and a listening with, but mainly as an existential experience, engulfing all of our senses, you know, because listening has to be has to, to be moved, has to be understood away from the categorical logic of the modern knowing subject, away from the specific um, divisions and distinctions that have been enforced through the westernized university. As an, ex as an existential experience engulfing all of the senses, in engulfing the material as well as the immaterial, and that really wants to identify what is not being said, what is not being lived, and what is not being experienced, and specifically about the things that cannot be said and that cannot be heard, right? So us as, as people trained within a westernized academy, as, as people trained within um, these, these, these forms of traditions and these canons of thought, there, there's a lot, even if we're working alongside modernity's others, others of modernity, people othered by modernity, communities, civilizations, epistemes othered by modernity, there are things we cannot hear. There are things they will not say. And it's that form of listening that will allow us to, to, to identify a decolonial agenda and that will allow us to, to engage with modernity's others in generative ways that will provide starting points, let's say, for, for alternative futures. So the horizon in, 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 in this kind of research would not be research that wants to produce knowledge, but would be research that, or that would not be research that starts with knowledge production, but would be research that starts with unlearning. So a research that allows us to unlearn the categories, the assumptions, the common sense, um, the dogmas, the, the principles, the methodologies, the, the ways of knowing the methods and so on, that, that have become omnipresent for us, to humble our processes of knowledge, so to work against modernity's knowing subject in, in, in many different ways, to bridge across colonial wounds and against the colonial difference, to, to dealing, to push towards the pluriverse. And by doing this, through these various components of, of, of research, which, which have to become the horizon of research, the vector that orients it, that determines one, what kind of, what, what questions we ask, what methods we use, um, what answers we pursue, how do we do this, to whom, who do we speak to, how do we disseminate it, and so on. By doing all of this, by doing this unlearning, research becomes not a process of knowledge production, and not even a process of knowledge making, but a process of listening to knowledge that already exists, and turning it and, and, and transforming it in, into, um, not transforming it, and pushing the university into accepting it as enunciable knowledge, right? Moving it from the category of the illegitimate, of the unenunciable, into the category of the legitimate and the enunciable. And it is that kind of research that a decolonial agenda, the way I understand it, pursues as the horizon of what can, of, of what can and cannot assist us in, in finding solutions to our crises. So if I go back to, um, to this, this kind of research agenda would, would work against university and against academia as tools of coloniality by disturbing the university's categorization of, who of what the legitimate knowledges are, of who the legitimate knowledge producers are, and of, who the, of, and of what kind of legitimate knowledge dissemination and who legitimate knowledge disseminators are. So it would be a process of research that's not really, um, that is really working against, but that's really breaking away from, from these core assumptions. And that again would, would work against modernity's knowing subject in a sense whereby we'd no longer have a locus of enunciation that erases and silences, 
but we transform it into a pursuit of voicing and, and a visibilization of specifically what has been erased and silenced over the past 500 years by the westernized university itself. And, and personally, I think there is the possibility of, um, of doing that within, within the research, right? And of course, there are a lot of questions and issues that we can discuss here about um, what kind of, you know, how can you be within the university and do this and remain within the university, publish within the university, you know, how can you even publish this kind of work? Who, who's going to publish it? What kind of outlets? Uh, who's going to listen to it? What kinds of, what kind of courses can you, can you teach if, if you're taking this approach? And these are all major issues that definitely need to be discussed and that need to be explored and, and, and addressed and theorized. But, but despite these challenges, I do hold that, um, that this kind of approach of, of transforming research into something that is an, an, an unlearning experience, into a humbling experience, into a bridging experience, a delinking one, a one that pursues pluriversality, and one that is, that is really about listening and defined or the conceptualized the way, the way I've presented it here, is possible. And that through that possibility, um, research offers a, a very, very, very important space to resist not just the westernized university, but to resist the wider modernity of, what, of which it is a part. And then to, to, to kind of, it, it's important, Mario, you, you mentioned Bevenutra de Sousa Santos, and he has a really, really powerful expression that, other, that others have said as well, but, but, but his formulation of it really stands out to me. There cannot be modern solutions to modern problems, right? And a lot of research is supposedly this way of Finding, pro finding solutions to the problems that we face, right? And this isn't just in the social sciences, of course. I'm not speaking just of re I'm not speaking of research in the social sciences only. I am speaking of research across the disciplines. But if from a decolonial position, there are no modern solutions to these problems, research it must and need to be oriented as as an engagement with what has been termed the non-modern, which which which, which with what has been erased and excluded and invisibilized as non-modern to, from there, identify solutions and, 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 ident and identify alternatives and then, trans and then present these as legitimate alternatives. Okay, um, that's it, I'll stop there. But I just wanted to highlight that some of the things that you, I, I'm pretty sure people are familiar with, but just in case anyone is not, so, Global Social Theory is this website that's been set up um, that, that is really interesting and that's trying to put together different theorists from across the Global South that have been working in, in different post de anti colonial traditions and, and, um, and doing this work. It presents them in interesting ways. It can be used as a teaching resource, but it also can be used to kind of um, explore a lot of the things that we never get to encounter within the academy and within universities. Um, there are a lot of projects in this respect. The Alternative Reading List project is a really interesting one. It's more developed in some disciplines than it is in others, um, but it provides really good alternatives. The Anti-Racist Educator, which is something that, that's trying to work across universities and other forms of education, but that's also really interesting. Of course, outlets that have been trying to do this, um, Discover Society, and I would say the New Humanitarian as well, are some of the outlets that have been whose approach has been doing this, of course, not in all of their work. And, and, and I'm not saying that not some, you know, so there are limitations to this, but these are interesting places um, to engage with, with some of the issues that are being raised by modernity's others. Um, importantly, and in, in what I would want to add here in terms of resources is post anti and decolonial intellectuals and activists, but most importantly, indigenous movements. And I have put it institutions in there. Of course, these would be not institutions in the sense of that we would um, define institutions in kind of a modern institution sense, but in the sense of very, very different forms of coming together and of organizing things um, that used to propagate, not that, that are and were used to propagate knowledge, that are and were used to have particular models of economy, particular models um, of governance, um, very, very different from the ones we have that exist and that continue to exist and that exist in, in very different forms of, res of, of, of resistances in very different parts of the world and across the world that are very rich sites that we can and need to start engaging with, not as objects of study, of course, but as, um, as, as, as modernity's others 
who, who have a lot to teach us. I'll, I'll stop there and, and, and maybe we can pick up on some of these themes in, um, in, in the remainder of the session. Thank you very much, Ali. This was again very thought provoking, also providing us with certain steps to consider as we embark on our research. Do we have any questions or comments related to that part or the earlier one? 